Okay, thank you for reconvening after the coffee break. I know it's still early in the morning. I appreciate all your attention to Jerome's really interesting <laughs> lecture for me at least, <laughs> with many points, but I didn't have time to discuss them. Hopefully we'll discuss more during lunch. And we were back for the second panel of the day, um, which in a way intends to tackle the question of Marxism and Marxism in social and socialist art histories, but also in, in the artistic production uh, in the region in various forms. Um, and I'll start by um, acknowledging that I haven't done my homeworks for today very well. I apologize again. Uh, so I won't have a written presentation. I'll just go through the slides and um, show you some of my ideas about this. And of course, I, I forgot to introduce myself. I have to do it. So I'm Christian. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm a professor here at George Enesco National University of Arts and uh, the director of this recently uh, instituted Institute of Contemporary Art, but uh, you know, the Institute is me, as I was saying yesterday. I hopefully in the future we'll have more people joining us. Uh, and thank you for supporting our university as well through this conference. Um, I, um, my interests are, my research interests gravitate around exhibition histories, critical art history in Eastern and Central Europe, uh, mostly focusing on the period since 1960s. So I did less research on socialist realism so far. Um, and um, well, I had some scholarships at Getty in, I've been a Fulbrighter to uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. I don't know what else to say. I've conducted some <laughs> research projects with Madalena Brasovanu as well. Um, and some other Romanian colleagues and with some of you that already know me in the in other contexts and conferences. So going back to our topic today, um, I would start with, uh, with this artwork by uh, Mladen Stilinovic that many of you might know, which says work is a disease. And it's quoted Karl Marx. Uh, it's been Long ago, when I was here and I had the privilege to interview Mladen Stilinovic about these works, he was here, uh, brought in an exhibition by uh, Dora Heg in Zsuzsa Laszlo in the context of the Peripheric Biennale. And asking him especially about this work, he, he, talked, he told me that um, my question was, how, how did you manage to go with this, uh, with this quotation, which is clearly fake? Um, it's invented by the artists. And he said, well, it's simple because I don't think anybody actually read Marx or read completely Marx. So who knows if in one of his texts, maybe there is this quotation. So the censorship could not censor my work because they didn't know, would we do something okay if we censor it, then perhaps somebody else from the party would come and say, why? I mean, it's Marx. You, 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 you should put it on its official art. Uh, and then using this red symbolistics. Yeah. So, so, so the artwork passed and he could exhibit it, which made me consider for today a, a series of questions about Marxism, actually. Uh, first, what was read from Marx and by whom? Secondly, whose Marx are we talking about when we talk about Marxism? Which marks, which means from which writings, precisely. And after all, for the new generation, who was Marx anyway? Because I don't believe many of my students would vaguely remember this as a thing from the past, not from the present, where everybody's interested just in NFTs and many other things that come with technologically advanced societies, at least our students in the art, not art history department, those might know who was. <laughs> was. Um, so I, uh, of course, um, what I'm showing you here are different editions and versions of some of Marx's works. Most of them, of the of the interpretations, also in philosophy in in, in Romania, focused on the capital. And I think it's been 
uh, the work that was most commented and issued of strands of interpretations all over the world, I mean, all over the socialist world, and in, as I will, I will try to show you in, in the so-called new leftist um, thinking, but also, um, together with Angus, he is also very well known for writing the Communist Manifesto. And um, what's missing in, in, in that slide is perhaps something that I will go um, for later is Boris Groys's recent response with the post-communist manifesto, but I'll, I'll go there a bit later. Um, so for the first part of my introductory talk, I would like to remind you several topics that were picked up from Marx and associated with Marxism, especially in the so-called Western world. First, uh, it's the question of labor, and I think it's very important to, to redefine art as a type of labor and artistic labor itself. Uh, some of the attempts that have been done to, to discuss this in various terms, and the most recent ones, go towards um, um, also the digital culture and the Anthropocene with Mackenzie Walk's Molecular Red. Um, but of course, we have Julia Bryan Wilson's Art Walkers, um, who tackles the question of the effects of conceptual art in the USA, uh, in the Art Workers Coalition in the early 70s, and the artist strikes, and the attempts to unionize, and perhaps the failures to unionize at that point, but also how it radically changed the notion of doing art and practicing art as labor. And of course, also, I was interested in the idea of handicap, uh, handicraft, aesthetic labor, and the politics of work in art in the sense that we need also to acknowledge today how much art and craft were also intermingled in the socialist uh, world. And I think there's something yet to be done and to be written about. I haven't done a research on this, of course, but I think it's still, as Jerome was throwing out I, some of potential ideas here, please allow me to do in a similar way and present potentialities of research that I haven't yet done. And I think it's uh, important. With the notion of labor, of course, came the notion of class solidarity, contributive justice, and especially the, the feminist um, art historical ideas that were drawn by, um, by this Marxist um, interpretations, especially I, where we have also Silvia Federici, who in, in the Italian context and the Italian operaismo was, was quite important in, in, in putting up those questions in the feminist context. We have Gramsci, uh, who became a, a, a very important figure as well in Romania. So uh, from, from point to point, I will refer to the Romanian context, which I know much better, and you will find few references around, but I think it's the task of my colleagues in the panel to fill in the gaps for other countries. So I won't go very much into those um, countries. And of course, uh, it has been very influential for Ernesto La Claus Chantelmo's hegemony and socialist tragedy, because they also tried to redefine what politics is and to get into this idea, not only of hegemony, but also of agonism. Um, I'm sorry. And a very important moment for me is the, the moment when Alt Louis Althusser and Jacques Rancière in, in, in France start reading Capital, or rereading actually Marx through and rereading Capital. And they have, um, they have insisted on um, not only on historical materialism, but also on dialectical materialism, and uh, re reread the notion of ideology by putting up uh, an interpretation on complexifying Marxist idea of base and superstructure. And al um famous text on ideology and the state apparatuses uh, showed us the way ideology controls, but also shapes subjectivities and social life. Um, just a footnote, I think it's also interesting to, to, to research the relationship between Michel Foucault and al here and the translation or mistranslations between dispositif 
and uh, apparatus that we took over more uh, or less. There are some important differences between this, but also some similarities, and I will focus on, on similarities in, in, in my case, because the dispositive is connected not only with the technologies of the self or with social institutions, but also with the idea of disposition. So I think it's also important to, to, to make this shift from French to English and uh, interpret it as a position towards something external, like a source of authority, which defines who you are at a certain moment, of course. And um, they were important because they raised the, the, the question of ideology and some of the critiques they received, of course, were that they forget the class struggle in, in, in Marxism at that point. And, of course, ideology has become very famous through Stuslav Zizek later, um, whereas um, the notion of, let's say, uh, the uh, social assembly, um, as Michael Hard and Antonio Negri, following on on the Italian tradition with Negri, uh, put forward um, and redefined what democracy might mean in in those um times of the 2000s uh tur turbulent times and trying to reinstill marxism as a sort of alternative to uh capitalist takeover of social organization and in this eastern european context i think one book that responded to such ideas retrospectively and i have in mind now what edit was telling us to revisit those perhaps unacknowledged imports of critical theory in the way we have read some of the activities, artistic activities that, that took place in the region. And I, I, I was thinking yesterday after her lecture, I inserted this slide, that I have to reread Anthony Gardner's book in relation to how he used Chantal Mouffe, especially, and Rancière's ideas about democracy in writing this uh, book. Uh, which I think is interesting for diagnosing some of the disparities of the so-called democratization process. In it's a large topic. I don't have time here, and I don't think we have time in the conference to to tackle it. It's probably the topic of a whole um, project that Edit is now involved in, and with others in in. So. Yeah, I'll leave it for others to, to unfold. Well, going to Marxism in Eastern Europe, um, there's been canonical readings and, of course, variations. Um, I'm showing you some of the ways Marx have been associated with Lenin, for instance, or especially with Engels. In, we had a, a whole series called Bibliotheca Marxist Leninista. So the Marxist Leninist Library, publishing regularly books that became. Um, <sighs> compulsory readings in especially higher education systems, um, the origin of the family, the private property in the state, the dialectics of nature, and some um, very carefully edited writings and selections that they were doing actually to support the state apparatus. This is how Art Husser comes back in, in, in Eastern Europe to show us that actually Marx starts to be instrumentalized and support the, the official state apparatus. And, um, but uh, we also had these variants of, of, of Marxism that were trying to uh, recuperate, to reread, and to perhaps um, reconstruct it as. Uh, as an alternative to the canonical and ossified version that was supporting state socialism. So a, a sort of revisiting from the inside and it's, it's been Georg Lukács and then the so-called Budapest school that became very important in Romania. They have translated especially the aesthetic writings of Lukács. So I'm showing you what has been translated to Romania. And um, also very interesting that one of the most famous uh, ideologues of the party and in Romania, a famous professor in the uh, Georg Georgiou Dej Academy in Bucharest, and then when they were doing courses of Marxism and Leninism with compulsory Gulian, um, 
is uh, is trying at some point to associate Marxism and structuralism and reads this book. It's unusual in this context because otherwise Gulian would just produce very rough interpretations of Marx and apply them to everything else from the reading of the peasantry to whatever else you would like to. And also because I remember when I arrived in late 90s as a student in Yash in philosophy, they still had a lot of books of, of this kind and we had professors that were converted from professors of Marxist-Leninism to something else. The most interesting case we've got was someone who shifted from this to the history of religions. That was the most famous leap, I think more interesting leap from one thing to the other. But in a way it was uh, it was understandable because for all his life he, he was defending atheism, so he had to know what was the enemy. And <laughs> he just jumped in the other boat and saying how hard it was during communism for that person and that we now should reevaluate religion and he became a fervent supporter of that. So I, I, I just pointed out to Agnes Heller's work in sociology and the extension of Marxism by reading the, the, the theory of need in Marx. This is not the original book, of course, it's verse, so it's, it's a recent version. It's actually the recent version I had access to myself. I started to read this very late in my recent years. And this is an older version of the, of the book that she, uh, she simply co-wrote co with the, are the important authors in the Budapest school, especially Georg Markus. Um, going to towards art history, uh, Marxism in, entered, uh, especially in the Western uh, academia, through Arnold Hauser and later through, through T.G. Clark. In the case of Arnold Hauser, he was very much interested in how art was a production of certain institutional demands and at that point the institutions were defined variously through various epochs who were the commandatories of the works who was the public and to 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 what did they respond so what was basically the social function of art and it was criticized um of being too um deterministic in this response the respect uh, famously by jonathan harris in his book about the new art history and T.G. Clark has been positioned by Harris as, as, as being a sort of a more refined version of social art history in which the notion of ideology becomes central and ideology is in a way inescapable. This is how we reach also later towards Zizek saying the same things that we cannot escape ideology. Any escape from ideology would be to invent a new ideology or to fall into a new ideological trap and so on. Um, in, in the Romanian case, to make this comparison, what we... Uh, experience among others, and I think it's interesting for you, is a revisitation of the revolutionary impetus of um, of what was associated with Marxism. And it's, it's being applied retrospectively first by Petru Comarnescu, who reads uh, Octave Bancila, who was a socially in inclined, so to speak, painter, uh, sympathetic for many <laughs> A peasant movement. Uh, this, this is the uprising of 1907 on, on, and that he chose for the cover of his book. And he reads this as a form of class struggle and he focuses on revolution. Uh, and then we have Jon Frunzetti, another Romanian art critic and art historian who, among others, in the 80s, writes a book about revolutionary paintings from 1848. And this is how Marxism, nationalism, are combined because it's the period of so-called national communism in Romania. This is how historians labeled it. I didn't label it this way. It's Vladimir Tismanian and others who proposed the term. And um, But it signals somehow uh, a reduction of um, in the internationalist agenda of communism and the um, growing focus on the national the construction of the nation, the imaginary community, and the rest from Benedict Anderson's are, are, are very, are, are very usable here, despite the fact that they were created in a different context. Because 
what they were doing were to reread the revolution, but also the revolutionary impact is to support the cause of the continuity of Romanian people here and of the nation. So a sort of a long durée, long historical durée. Other uh, interesting art historians are perhaps Mircea Deac with the revolutionary humanism in Romanian plastic arts, and also the director of the National Museum of Contemporary Art, Kalin Dan, who writes this book on the image of the worker in Romanian graphics towards the, eight of the, the end of the 80s. It's, um, it's interesting also because the question of work comes back first, but in a different way. It's, it's work itself, not artistic work, but the representation of work and workers. And secondly, because I think it's interesting how this notion of humanism that I tackled somewhere else in my former presentation on the article, looking at socialist humanism evolves. And in this case, I found it late, uh, this revolutionary form of humanism that is supported by Mircea Deac. Um, I would like to just briefly remember that we have also artistic encounters between what would be uh, a sort of a new leftist community in the Czech Republic with Milan Knizek and the actual, uh, who seemed a sort of a utopia or, or attempt to live in a sort of communal utopia in fifth, sixth, seven, sixty-eight. I think I have to check it, or perhaps Pavlina can help me here. Yeah. But what I found interesting in the archives of MoMA when I researched this topic is that he compares um, his intentions to set up a sort of an artistic utopian community with what he finds because he goes to the USA and he starts to criticize, okay, hippie communities in the USA are not what I expected to do. And there are some hints at that in, in, in Thomas Popish's articles, article that is included in his book, An Associative Art History. Uh, and, and in the documents in, in MoMA, I found this part, I would like to read to you very quickly because they're not the best images. At that moment, I had a very lousy phone. So I'm sorry, I, I, I bought better ones now. I, I'm richer. Um, now it's a question of class, yeah. Um, and he says this, what has perhaps the strongest influence on the genesis of the idea of the A community on the birth of the wave of togetherness? Um, was the antagonism of the society around us. Because at the beginning, almost all of us who gathered in that community had an obstinate, a more than obstinate desire to serve contemporary society. So he was not against it, but somehow reforming it, trying to reimagine it. Uh, that idea, of course, survived, but in a general form, for it proved quite impossible to work together with contemporary Czechoslovak society. It classified every one of our efforts um, to separate with it as almost a crime. And so we were forced to establish the principle of illegal uh, messianism to which we tried to, I don't know what's written there, our notion of society, because he, he writes, he cuts down the word and writes by hand at that point. And in the other a slide, he, he talks about the big differences between existing Western communities and the actual community as he conceived it. And among others, he quotes individualism and individual differences between people in, in the USA that are values that are highly praised. And, uh, and one more thing, perhaps we have the marks of Giza Panetti's uh, stamp um, project um, that um, he actually envisaged as on the occasion of a centenary of Marx that was organized by a museum in Archheim. He received this invitation and he thought about doing this Marx test uh, as a sort of mail art form uh, that he sent to many um, of his colleagues in the community. And he received various versions that you can see here uh, from various mail artists. And it's also interesting to, to, to read very very briefly, the fact that um, he, first of all, says that perhaps Marx has become a, an icon or a figure of 
of a sort of father figure. So he claims a sort of a psychoanalytic interpretation of Marx as associated with, that, with the authority, but also to humanize it as the painter's father or rather his grandfather. A bit outdated, worn out, clumsy and offhand, I quote, but still full of his youthful naivety and curiosity. One could become angry with him, once again smile at him, a nearly supernatural hate love grimace around his head, and one could have a presentiment of the lack of a real father of the youth today. Um, and then um, he also tries to evaluate what he received and the differences between Eastern European artists that responded and Western European artists that responded. Says, Pathetic arrangement of, um, on a, another variant. The authority which is present is tried to be pushed aside by a love better than, to be loved better than. Pathetic arrangement of these um, are mainly typical of the Eastern countries, while playfully ironical ones are mainly typical of the West. And then he goes on to speak about Marx as being a sort of an alternative, uh, but I won't read much of these texts, if you are interested, you can find them also. I photographed them, but I later found them. They are very well preserved in the online art pool archive, actually. So these are versions that I retrieved on, from the internet later. Um, and um, he, he basically refers to Marx here as a sort of a free-floating signifier, a signifier that lost its meaning and tries to be re-injected with relevance and context. Uh, and he also associates it with a, perhaps a hippie icon at, at, at some point, because he says who was Marx and questioning, well, perhaps the um, someone who opposes the hippie culture and the youth, he says, the enemy of people who have long hair and so on. But what if we reinterpret Marx to be a friend of them, not the enemy? And I reached the final part of my talk today, talking about recuperating Marxism after 1989, because I think in, in that project, there are some perhaps interesting ideas to revisit the past and reread again Marx, but also uh, attempts that have been already done by others uh, among the emancipatory potentialities, of course, is to look back at uh, um, the women's struggles and uh, internationalism in, during the socialist world. And um, some attempts have already been made, notably by Agata Jakubowska. Also, Madalena Radromska uh, attempted to reread from a Marxist perspective some of the topics that we're interested in here, especially. In, she has a text in this book that she co-edited as well uh, about limitations uh, of horizontality from a Marxist perspective. Uh, and I'll end up with uh, an artwork by Milica Tomic, who in 2004, it's entitled Reading the Capital, again, about Marxism and the way multiple readings produce multiple meanings and understanding and uses of Marx. The latest one, it's an artwork in 2004 where she has asked wealthy Texans to read Marx Capital, uh, which was used, of course, to explain and counter at the same time the accumulated wealth. And then Texas was a sort of metonymy of accumulated capital on a global scale in the hands of the few. Um, what is clear, uh, and I'll conclude my talk, is that socialism is, of course, not local anymore, and that has not been for a long time. It has never been, um, because of its international aspirations, uh, uh, a characteristic of Central and Eastern Europe per se, but rather, I think it was meant to be a more global alternative, perhaps. And recuperating Marxism also has the potentiality still today to show and sometimes has also shown in some cases artistic or uh, art historical, uh, just that the potentiality of reading or rereading Marx as a critical alternative to the present. Thank you for your attention.